to Masan a live chat. Um, I've got a whiskey at the <laughs> moment just to sort of uh, loosen me up a bit. It's been a big day and sorry that we started off so late. Um, We're only so, eight minutes late today. That's better than last time. That's good. Excellent. So um, what are we actually doing today, Andrew? <laughs> today we are going to talk about Masan. Um, Masan is a great variety. It yep. comes from the northern Rhone Valley, which is in the south of France. And it's a variety that's kind of close to our hearts. It's one that we really enjoy making. We really enjoy drinking. And I think it has a, a little bit of a special place here on the Granite Belt. Yeah. The thing is, it grows really well here in the Granite Belt, uh, particularly in our vineyard as well. Um, it sort of grows like a weed. Uh, we tend to source our grapes um, from other parts of the Granite Belt as well. Um, there is a favourite little vineyard that we like to get our grapes from, which is just outside of Stanthorpe, very mm -hmm. close to the race course. Um, it's the O'Reilly Vineyard, and um, we've been getting some really good grapes from there as well. All these, this lovely Masan. Masan's an interesting variety because um, it grows so well in granite soils. And being in the granite belt, I suppose, um, that's why um, we're so keen on growing it. So that, that's kind of one of the, the two big parallels, I suppose, between us here in the granite belt and the northern Rhone Valley, which is the home of Marsan in the world. So the, the northern Rhone Valley, and I've got a little bit of a map to show you. So if you look up there in the top right, you can see the whole of France. And then there's the little square, which is where the Rhone Valley is. And then in the larger map, you can see there's the big purple area down the bottom. And that's um, the Southern Rhone Valley, where there's a lot of red. There's a lot of Shiraz, a lot of Grenache, a lot of Grenache Blanc. A bit of Marsan happens down there as well. But we're mostly interested in that orange part at the top of the map, the Northern Rhone Valley. They do some famous Shiraz there, but the three whites of the northern Rhone Valley are Vionia, Marsan, and Roussan. We call them the three Rhone sisters, and we'll talk about that later on. But the thing that's really interesting about this is that it's a river valley, and if you have a look back over at the whole map of France there, you can see we're kind of over on the east side. So if you extend up towards the middle of France, we start to head over towards uh, Burgundy. Burgundy is definitely not granite soils, but the very southern end of Burgundy, there's a little place called Beaujolais, which is famous for its granite soils and a wine called Gamay Noir. And the, that southern bit of Burgundy extends down into the northern part of the Rhone Valley, and there is literally this belt of granite that runs through that part of France which is why it's really interesting how those Northern Rhone varieties seem to work so well for us. I've got another little picture here, which is a picture I took the last time I was over there. And you can really see how those vineyards are very much decomposing granite. That is absolutely what um, typifies the, the soil types and like soil is a bit of a, a generous term when you're talking about the rocky ground where this stuff is planted but if any of you have been out to the granite belt or seen photos you know you'll know that our soil is also incredibly poor and incredibly rocky and incredibly granitic so I think that's a really big um, parallel that we have with that part of the world. Mm. And grapes have been growing there since the times of the Romans um, I think it was Julius Caesar who who invaded Gaul in the AD 50s, 54, something like that. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. And, uh, and you know, when you go to certain places uh, uh, in the, say, for example, the Southern Rhone, like when you go to places like Arles, you can find some really interesting um, antiquities, things like, um, like Colosseums. Uh, uh, where yeah, they used to have gladiatorial fights. There's a famous one in Nîmes, which I think Nîmes is the well. second biggest one after the Colosseum in Rome or something. Yeah, it's, something like that. It's certainly impressive. I've been there. So, yeah, there's, there's, uh, this is an area steeped with tradition, 
with history and yeah the grapes grapes have been growing there for two millennia which is at least two millennia which is pretty amazing so they've had a lot of time to work out what grows well for them and the other really interesting parallel i think we have with the northern rowing valley is climate sunshine the south of france is all about sunshine you know it's all about the Côte d'Azur and the riviera and all that kind of stuff but being European, they still kind of have those cooler nights. So the kind of hot, sunny days and cool nights, I think, is another really strong parallel with our little part of the world up here in Queensland. Yeah. And I think you can you can classify this area as well as, you know, part of Provence, you know, that sort of like southern France, that, that holiday area where people love to uh, uh, take their summer holidays, where they love to party where they love to drink and eat, I suppose. And it's this area has a great tradition in gastronomy, uh, food and wine matching, and uh, it's a whole heap of fun to visit. It definitely is. Yeah. So I suppose Marsan also has a little bit of a, a history here in Australia. Northern Rome varieties have been very well known here in the Granite Belt. There is one other place in Australia where Marsan is iconic i suppose well that's to bilk and where is to it's in riverland isn't it nagambi lakes nagambi lakes and uh yeah hot uh um uh growing grapes that have got concentrated flavor um yeah and they've been growing masan there i would imagine for ages like for centuries no, a century. Well, their their hallmark wine is the nineteen twenty seven. So I yeah. assume that's when their vineyards were planted. Yeah. So so almost a hundred years old. So yeah, very very interesting area, Nagambi Lakes, <laughs> and the winery to Bilk. We don't call it Chateau de Bilk anymore. <laughs> One of the few wineries, I suppose, that has made a name for itself in Marsan as a variety. Yeah. Though there are lots of good other good examples around in Australia. Yeah. So we've actually got three Marsans to try today and, and we've got um, an interesting range. We've actually got a cellar release, a, uh, a 2005, a very old wine, a very interesting wine, and we've only just released it um, about a month ago, yeah? Not even. Not it's even. Brand spanking new. Brand spanking new. 2005 cellar release. Uh, we're going to compare that with the 2017 Marsan and the 2018 Marsan as well. And so, as you can see, the 2018 Marsan is the Bent Road Marsan. And the other two wines are under our La Petit Moor, uh, range. We want to start off with that, talking about making Marsan, and why we would put the 18 under a different label. Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose the 18 under a different label is, is more of what we would classify a, um, a more commercially uh, um, uh, popular type of style. Yeah, a more modern style. A more modern style. Modern Australian. Yeah. Um, a style that is, I suppose, a little bit more generous in fruit character. And, um, yeah, um, a great food wine. Um, I always say very good with Asian food. And I can put shit on Asians because I'm 60% Asian. So, you know, just deal with it. Um, so I suppose that's in contrast to the other two wines, the yeah. 05 and the 17, which are made in a, a more traditional kind of style. I mean, I guess you could say a more serious style of wine. Um, and I suppose that's why they deserve to be under the La Petit Moor label, because it's an unusual thing to try to make a serious single variety Bassan in Australia. Yeah. And I would dare say that the the two serious Bassans are a great alternative to a serious Chardonnay. You know, um, both both examples uh, had a little bit of barrel fermentation, uh, a little bit of complexity that's been sort of uh, developed 
uh, with the with the barrel fermentation, and as well, you know, with the two thousand and five, this is a wine um, that has proven to have great longevity. Uh, two thousand and five was an excellent vintage. It was a vintage where we saw not only wines that were very uh, ripe and delicious, but showed a lot of delicious, juicy uh, uh, acidity. And acidity in white wines is a great characteristic that is going to allow the wine to have good longevity. Absolutely. I, I think it's really interesting. We'll taste the 05 second, I think, um, for right. the 17. So, but. Let's, go for this, let's go for the 17 first. Okay, barrel fermented, 2017. One thing that I always think of Masan is I always think that that uh, it has hallmarks of honey, that beeswaxy sort of character. Yeah, for me, it's all about beeswax. You get that kind of little delicate floral honeyed aroma to it. But Masan is it's quite reserved. It's quite subtle. So it's just this little tiny hint of honey and florals. But then on the palate, it kind of follows through with that little honey note. But for me, particularly in the, the style of wine we've made with the 05 and the 17, it's all about this kind of round mouth coating texture to the wine. It's not a wine that has a lot of flavor. There's not lots of fruit and blossoms and stuff leaping out of the glass at you. It's really quite reserved and you kind of have to look fairly hard if you want to find fruit flavors to talk about. But it still has this presence. It still just fills and coats the palate somehow. Mm. It has this. It has this. Um, it has this characteristic where it sort of like opens up in the mid palate. It's sort of like really interesting. It, um, it's very hard to to describe, I suppose. Well, I have a very non wine description of this wine. So I mentioned before the three varieties of the Northern Rhone Valley, Vionia, Marsan, and Roussan. And Glenn hates this story, but I like to talk about them as I don't the... hate it. You have issues with it. <laughs> um, I about... like to talk them about them as the three Rhone sisters because each one of them has their own distinct personality. Roussan... She's the quiet one. She's kind of the wallflower in the group. She, you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Roussan can be a little bit hard work sometimes. Mm. You know, if you're on a hen's night, she's the one with the clipboard making sure everyone gets on the bus, makes it to the next venue. <laughs> but she brings something. You know, it's worth having her along. And, yeah, she does okay in a group environment. Vionya, on the other hand... She's the big girl with a big personality. She's the, the voluptuous one that is a laugh a minute. She's the Marilyn Monroe. You know, she's big and curvaceous and buxom and gorgeous. Creamy. And then we have Marsan. And Marsan is the stylish one. She's a little bit reserved, but, you know, she's suave. She's sophisticated. She's well put together. You know, she's not out there like Vionia is, but she's not quiet and mousy like Roussan is. She's just poised, I think is a nice way to put it. Well, I'm thirsty for five, oh okay. five. Go for five. Let's go for oh five. And the oh five shows some really interesting um, um, uh, tertiary characters, uh, uh, maturing characters. I'm really surprised by this wine. When we looked at re-releasing it as a cellar wine i i was interested but I'm, i have to admit you know, i wasn't sure if it was going to be anything terribly exciting because this was an early picked style of marsan the alcohol in this is quite low it's about 11 yeah. ish yeah. i think and for me it's developed in this really interesting way which i think shows a lot of similarity to a hunter semion absolutely Absolutely. And it has, it almost has that um, um, aged Riesling sort of character as well, I find. Yeah, it has that little bit of kind of slaty development on the nose. And I suppose, unlike a Hunter Semyon, which develops honey later in its life, 
this always had the honey, but it's still there. And I think maybe that's that thing that's tricking us into thinking about aged semion is that it's got that lightness of body. It's got that honeyed note. It's still got that kind of steely slaty development. But apart from that, it still looks really fresh. Mm. I mean, this is a 15 year old wine. Mm. I get, I'm getting sort of like quince characters in this and, um, um, you know, that sort of like quince paste, quince jam sort of character, mm. um, which is which I find really, really interesting. But it still has that waxiness to it, which yeah. is not slipperiness. It's not oiliness. It's a really unique kind of character to mm. Marsan, I think. Mm. Mm. I, I suppose you don't often see um, aged Marsans until you sort of look at uh, Tabulk wines. And um, Tabilk has cellar release wines as well. Um, I'm not quite sure what the what the uh, recent cellar release is for Tabilk, but they often release wines that are over ten years old, um, um, which you can pick up at, at you know places like Dan Murphy's <laughs> and stuff like that, which is pretty amazing. Um, and it just goes to show you that that Masan has great hallmarks for longevity, you know, and, and particularly this style, this style being high in acid. Um, and, and um, yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think for me what's interesting is whilst these wines definitely have plenty of acid, which is a really important factor in ageing, usually another thing that we look at is fruit weight yeah, the absolutely. more fruit a wine has the more aging potential it has because as the wine gets older the fruit is the thing that drops off over time and it's interesting with these wines that they didn't start out with a lot of fruit so what they've developed are these really interesting as you said tertiary characters these flavors that were not in the wine to start with so there was no fruit to lose really but what we have gained are all these interesting notes of complexity. Mm. And I, I think it goes to show you that that um, grape varieties that are uh, typically uh, um, neutral, and, you know, Chardonnay is typically neutral as well. Mm. You know, um, neutral white wines can often be great white wines like Chardonnay, like Marsan. Mm, absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Should we look at some 18? Let's look at some 18. 18 is generous. It's got it's a whole different kettle of fish. It's a whole different it? kettle of fish. As well in the body as well. It has this fullness in, in body. Um, uh, it shows the the warm year that uh, 2018 was it is uh, it's a completely different wine it's very sort of it's much bigger much fuller mm. on the palate and um, I would dare say just a slight amount of residual sugar and I can't quite remember how much residual sugar there was I, and there wasn't much you know when you consider uh, uh when you're looking at sugar and you're looking at classifications of wines you know a, a bone dry wine uh, is between zero to 2.5 grams of residual sugar 2.5 grams per liter of residual sugar so even at 2.5 grams per litre of sugar, that gives not a sense of sweetness, but a sense of fullness in the mid palate. Mm. And um, not having our notes in front of us, uh, this, this wine doesn't have a sense of sweetness, but it has a sense of fullness. So I would say that this wine has residual sugar at the low end at the dry low end. Yeah, so I mean, if we consider a dry wine is under about six grams yeah. per litre, I would say this is somewhere between two and a half and six. Six grams per litre, yeah. I think the other thing 
that makes this wine a little different in style is there's a bit of Viognier in it. Indeed. And it's amazing how a little bit of Viognier in a blend goes a long way. In terms of labelling, the wine is labelled as Marsan because it has less than 15% of other stuff in it. So we don't have to put it on the label, but I know for a fact there is a small percentage, single figures, of Viognier in this wine. Which, is there a little bit of Roussan in here as well? There may be, but it I, would be such a tiny yeah. amount. Cause and that's the thing. because I think we picked about 200 kilos of Roussan. Yeah. The thing is, um, uh, when we made this wine, uh, um, uh, we had a small amount of Viognier. We had a small amount of, amount of Roussan, so small, um, less than, than um, I want to say less than 7% of, of Viognier, um, that, that legally we were allowed not to uh, uh, declare um, that, that variety. Uh, this is an interesting thing that, you know, if you are blending wines and... And we're big fans of blending. We are very big uh, fans of blending. When you're blending wines and you've got a component that is below fifteen percent of the total of the total wine, uh, you don't you uh, don't need to declare it. Or to put it another way, the wine has to be eighty five percent whatever it says on the label. If it says granite belt, it has to be at least eighty five percent granite belt. If it says Marsan, it has to be at least eighty five percent Marsan. If it says 2018, it has to be at least 85% 2018. So those are kind of the rules, I suppose. This is the interesting thing about um, when uh, people are marketing blends such as Shiraz Viognier. We're, we're, going out, we're going completely off track here. But we'll talk How about... surprising for us. Yeah, but we'll talk about Shiraz Viognier. You know, um, uh, Viognier being a white variety, blending it with... Shiraz, a red variety. Viognier uh, gives Shiraz more aromatics. It allows the wine to be more um, um, uh, aromatic in the glass. As well, the Viognier somehow weirdly deepens the colour of the Shiraz blend the resultant Shiraz blend but it also fixes the colour. It allows the colour to to be more stable. Uh, we at La Petite More, we, uh, when we tend to make a Shiraz Viognier, for example, uh, we never go above 2.5% in Viognier. Sometimes when you, when you see um, some Shiraz Viogniers, they have this weird sort of like apricot flavour, which I don't like. Uh, um, but it's interesting how when we only put 2.5% of Viognier in our blend, we always declare it. It's because people are familiar with it's the Shiraz style. Viognier style, hmm. you know, and, and so, and so uh, from a marketing point of view, it makes sense for us to declare Viognier, even though it's only 2.5% of the final blend. I, I think the moral of the story is, you know, when we make a Shiraz Viognier, that's a, a style that we are trying to express. So we want to put on the label that this is the style of wine we were aiming to make. When we are making something like a straight-up Marsan and we decide that a little bit of Viognier gives it just a little bit more body, a little bit more fullness, and basically makes it a more tasty wine, we don't necessarily feel the need to mention that because Marsan is still the style of wine that we're trying to yeah. make. And, you know, when you look at the wines of the Northern Rhone Valley, they don't label them by what's in them. You know, they're usually just called Rhone White. Yeah. And it's up to you to guess what might be in it. Yeah. So 2018, with a little bit of Viognier, with a little bit of Rose, uh, Roussan, to the, our 2018 is, is generous... Uh, a, a little bit more um, full-bodied, a little bit more voluptuous. Yeah, I, I think you know, it's certainly a very gastronomic style of wine. Yeah. Ta-da. Okay, so as a wrap-up, 
um, let's let's um, compare uh, the three. Um, let's go for 17 first. Well, I suppose 17 is that classic textural barrel fermented style of wine, which happens in this case to be made from Marsan. Yep. And I think um, 05 is basically what 17 would be um, aged, you know, um, uh, a wine that you can see uh, more tertiary characters, mm -hmm. that you can see how the, um, the fruit characters are actually sort of like creeping up. There's some really, really, inter as I said, there's some really interesting uh, um, quince characters um, uh, that are happening in the, two, uh, in the 05. It certainly is opening up, which is a very good sign for an aged wine. It means that it's got plenty of aging left in it yeah. if it develops nicely in the glass. And even now, you know, like uh, this, has been, uh, this wine has been opened for um, about half an hour. It's like opening up to the point where, you know, you're getting these florals coming in. And, and what I see in Marsan when it comes to florals I think of white flowers, I think of mock orange, I think of gardenia, I think of those sort of like white shrubby flowers. Uh, 2018. Uh, 18 is, it's rich, it's pleasing, it's satisfying, it's much heavier on the palate, it's much broader in the fruit spectrum, it's just a, a far more generous wine than the other two. Yep. And I think when it comes to looking at these three wines, the 17 the 05 and the 18, looking at it in that order, it just goes to show you how uh, there is a potential in Marsan. There's a complexity in Marsan, which is really, really interesting. Yeah, and in, in this case, it's it's interesting to see it in three very different styles, uh, an early picked aged style, a classic textural barrel fermented style, and a cleaner modern, more fruit-driven style. And I think it performs very well on all three counts. Ta-da! Um, is, is it a wrap-up? Awesome. Um, let's talk about our next... Well, do we have any questions first? Oh, Jack-Jack. Um, Daniel had a question before. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, we would love to plant Gamay. Gamay is top of my list of varieties I would love to play with out here. I think it is so relevant to the climate and the topography and the soil. There is one vineyard. There's one vineyard that we know in Fletcher that, that has Gamay. And, and they won't give us any. No. Wah, wah. That Gamay goes to another uh, uh, winery. The opposition, the enemy. <laughs> no, they're not the enemy. <laughs> they're just lucky, that's all. But no, I, last time I was in France, I spent uh, a solid week in Beaujolais uh, for the sole purpose of trying to find out whether my hunch that this region had a lot in common with ours was true. And I, I came back with the idea that that would be a very logical variety for us to have a play with. Yeah, I think as well, you know, um, those sort of styles of red wine are just becoming more and more popular. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, light, bright, spicy, drink now, drink young kind of styles, uh, they're on the up and up in Australia. Yeah. And um, we should be drinking these kind of wines that you can drink out of the fridge yeah. at the height um, of summer. We've also been finding that, you know, in our own portfolio that uh, our – Sangiovese, you know, our, um, our sort of Rosso type of wines, our Italian sort of type of wines, you know, uh, acid-driven, juicy, lighter styles of red mm. are becoming more and more popular. This is what we're showing at the cellar door and people are loving it. So, you know, uh, gone are the days when people want, you know, a big red with a cigar <laughs> I think, uh, I think, uh, save that for the Armagnac. Yeah. I think people are looking at the sort of like, uh, bright, uh, acidic, fresh, uh, a, a mouth watering, uh, um, thirst quenching 
sort of reds. I think that's it. I think it's that, what is Chance's Robinson's latest thing? It's refreshment factor. Yeah. Wines that have refreshment factor. And, you know, some of those big, generous, high alcohol, oaky wines, they are amazing wines, but I wouldn't describe them as refreshing. They're not Moorish. Yeah. And I think we're starting to grow into this idea of Moorish wine. And I think, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of like um, uh, horses for courses, you know. It's like what you, fe- what you feel like, uh, what's your mood. Yeah. I mean, you know, like not every day you're going to eat a triple brie. Not every day. Sadly. Not every day are you going to eat, you know, some sort of rich chocolate pudding. You know, it's like, it, and that's with wines as well. You know, not every day are you going to drink this sort of like rich, rich sort of wine, which can be sort of like a little bit, a little bit heavy and a little, you get a little bit bogged down on it, you know. One glass and it's like, whoa, that's enough. So off the back of talking about big, heavy, rich wine, Beaujolais, yes. <laughs> One more question from Dan. When is the door of the MR? Ooh. That is a good question. And, and Very relevant. It is very relevant. And, and only even today um, I've, I got uh, phone calls and complaints from, from uh, our uh, lovers in particularly in Sydney. It's like, when are we going to get this wine again? And um, we're working on it. And hopefully we're going to get it into bottle probably in the next two weeks, two weeks, three weeks. But it's going to be totally before Christmas. I'm going to go for two. Yeah, two, two weeks. Let's go for two. This time in a fortnight, it will be in a All right. Um, so does that mean we talk about our last and final broadcast for the year? Dun, Episode dun, 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 10, dun. double digits. Okay. What's happening? Well, we gave it some thought and we thought 10 is a milestone. It's a big number. We've reached double digits. So we probably need to do double bottles. And if there's one wine in the world that is... Synonymous Mag- with no, magnums, no, double Mag- bottles. No. It is champagne. Champagne for everyone. We also thought it would be really fun to devote a session to having a bit of fun and to drinking wine that we don't make. So we are going to do, drum roll please, Brrr. champagne trivia. Yay! As a... Tenth episode, just before Christmas, having some fun drinking wine, not made by us for a change. We are going to do champagne trivia and there will be an opportunity to win a magnum of champagne. Prize, 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 prize. So get your posses together. Make sure you don't miss this one. I promise you it will not be postponed. The 26th of November. Ooh. So think about Boxing Day, but a month early. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're going to drink a Scheiser Lord of Champagne. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a COVID party here. Uh, um, we're, we have to work out how many people we're allowed to have in the church. We're in the church at the moment. The church is big. They can spread out. That's yeah. fine. We just have to um, uh, check out our um, you know, COVID safe plan, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to widen widen whoops this way widen the um the camera uh to show um all the peeps in the church yeah we're going to drink a shiza of champagne um, it's a little bit like the last one it's going to be family dinner style yeah we'll um, we friends and family in the church and you can play along at home with our champagne trivia we haven't so between dis- now and then you need to drink lots of champagne you need to Read up on your champagne. Yeah, and we haven't quite decided what we're going to have for dinner either. That's co- that's going to be fun too. Something champenois, something northern. Ooh, we'll have to look into it. All right. Um, thanks for joining with us tonight. Um, we'll see you on the twenty sixth. See you then. Champagne, 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 champagne.